Hey y'all, welcome to Birth in 5 with me, Kihi, where I tell you science back tips and tricks to having an informed and confident birth in five minutes or less. I'm Kihi, a doula with my master's in human development and family studies, and I'm here to make sure that you have an informed and confident birth. Today we are talking about asynclitic babies, specifically artificial rupture of membranes cause asynclitic babies. The first place we need to start out is what is an asynclitic baby? Now, typically when your baby is coming through your pelvis, it's the top part or the crown of their head that comes first. Sometimes babies don't come down with their heads straight in the pelvis. Sometimes their heads are kinked into different directions. Sometimes they're flexed up. And sometimes your baby can be having their ear or their chin presenting first. If they are not coming down in a straight way in the pelvis, they're going to be considered asynclitic. Now, having an asynclitic baby is not a problem in itself. However, the severity of the malposition of the head is going to matter. Asynclitic babies can sometimes cause back labor, longer labors, or they can sometimes cause a longer pushing time too. So now that we know what an asynclitic baby is, I'd love to talk about anecdotally what we have seen when we uh, pair Artificial rupture of membranes, so uh, your provider or nurse rupturing your membranes, breaking your waters for you with asynclitic babies. Naturally, I tried to do research and pull the data on this, and surprisingly, I could come up with absolutely nothing. I did not find a single piece of data to either back this up or disprove it. So all I can report to you right now are the anecdotal findings of our team. So I want us to first start off by thinking, what is the purpose of your amniotic sac? In the labor process, it does play a specific role in the dilation process. That downward pressure of your amniotic sac, of your waters, they are going to provide uh, this downward pressure, this sensation, this weight on your cervix, which is going to help with effacement and dilation. Now, since this pressure is crucial, what happens when we release that before the body does it? Because we know your body will do it. Your body will break its own waters or your baby will be born in call, which is rare, but not dangerous at all. Also, we must consider what happens to your baby. So if you're thinking, oh my goodness, all the amniotic fluid is going to be out, my baby's not going to be able to breathe, not quite. They'll continue to make their own amniotic fluid. More so what we're thinking about is your baby did have a layer of cushion. They were floating, they were suspended in this water. And when we artificially break it before the body is ready to release that, we risk that your baby slams down into your cervix. Now, not only can that be a little painful, but it also increases the risk anecdotally from what our team has seen that your baby slams down in a position that is not straight on. So an unnatural asynclitic position. Another thing that we want to consider is that when your body breaks the amniotic sac on its own, it's a big rush. It's a big dose of oxytocin and prostaglandins and other hormones that your body needs to maybe get over a that your body is in right now in labor. If we take that away or use that up in early labor or earlier in labor when your body hasn't done it on its own, it makes me think about and consider what will we do if we get into a place where we've reached a lull, we've reached a breaking point, we've reached a place where your body needs a little oomph. Maybe it was where your body was going to use breaking your waters on its own but we took that from it earlier in labor. So what do you do if you get in that situation? Well, you've got to get some oxytocin going. You can obviously use nipple stim and um, clitoral stimulation, which both are not always effective because we sometimes can't get enough oxytocin by those ways. It also is a little bit challenging with people who might be modest um, and may not be comfortable with that option. If those two don't suit your fancy, then uh, Pitocin is going to be the only thing that you have left. We can sometimes get contractions going again with movement, but if we really need oxytocin going, it's going to have to be Pitocin most likely. Also, there's some notable evidence that with inductions, if you are four centimeters, we can add Pitocin and break your waters at the same time to yield a little bit of a shorter labor for you. 
I want to say again, this is not anything that I could back up or prove with research. I think it would be absolutely fascinating if somebody would fund the research to look at the data of whether there are increased risk with uh, artificial rupture of membranes. And if so, does the risk of having an asynclitic baby outweigh the benefits of a shorter labor or speeding up labor or progressing labor? I'll leave you to that. Until I see you next week for Birth in 5, be sure to check us out on Instagram or give our podcast a listen.